There was always this question about a star, whether a star would crunch. Well, you pile on more and more mass, you shovel more and more gravel onto the surface of the earth, you'll make it ultimately massive enough so it will crunch. Can you do anything to stop it? Well, uh, what resists collapse is rigidity, but there's a, a limit to rigidity because rigidity of a s piano string governs the pitch of the string. Rigidity of a steel rod governs the speed that sound will travel down the length of that steel rod. But we know there's a limit of the speed of light, and therefore there must be a limit to rigidity. And if you factor that line of reasoning in, you see that you can't have a material rigid enough in the interior of a star to keep it from crunching if you pile on enough, enough mass. So I didn't see any way to escape the idea of a star crunching to a black hole. I've been very impressed with my Dutch colleague, Jan Oort. He's no longer living, but he was the dean of astronomers while he lived. All through his life, one theme stood uppermost. Where is the mass that keeps things going? Where is the mass that holds the stars together in the Milky Way? Where is the mass that keeps stars circulating around in tight orbits near the center of the Milky Way? Where is the mass that holds the universe together? And that search for the missing mass is one that goes on today. I'm fascinated by the recent work of our Polish colleague, Bogdan Paczynski, on gravitational lensing. He said, maybe there are a lot of, there's a lot of mass out there in space that we don't see. Stars may have burned out and become dead may have collapsed to black holes, or may be just uh, cold, dead stars. Here I was having to give a lecture in New York at the joint meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the group of people known as the Society of Sigma Xi. Well, to give a survey of the frontiers, and I talked there about the variety of objects that we know about and can't expect to see that we haven't seen yet. And among them I talked of a completely collapsed star, something we might call a black hole. Well, that was the first mention in print of the subject. But I had come to that term a couple of months earlier in a meeting in New York where we were considering this fantastic finding of uh, Jocelyn Bell, the Cambridge research student working with Anthony Hewish, where they had uh, like clotheslines hanging out. They put uh, wires out uh, as radio antennas to pick up signals, and they found a regular pulse, 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 with a regularity that surpassed that of even the best atomic clocks. 
the source of these pulses coming from space, one could laughingly say is a sign of some advanced civilization out there. But more seriously, one looked at all the things that could be. And in this meeting, we considered rotating red giant stars, vibrating white dwarf stars, rotating neutron stars, and I argued that we ought to consider also the possibility they came from completely collapsed objects. Well, after you get through saying completely collapsed objects six times, you look for a shortcut, and that's when I found myself using the phrase black hole. Richard Feynman objected to the phrase that seemed to me to best symbolize the finding of one of the graduate students. Uh, graduate student uh, Jacob Bekenstein had shown that a black hole reveals by nothing outside it uh, what went in in the way of spinning electric particles might show electric charge, yes, mass, yes, but no other features. Or as he put it, a black hole has no hair. And Richard Feynman thought that was an obscene phrase. And he didn't want to use it, but, but uh, that is a phrase now often used to state this feature of black holes that they don't indicate any other properties other than uh, charge and angular momentum and mass. The Chinese records back as far as 1054 give us information that we don't have recorded otherwise. They had spotted a Nova, a new star in one region of the sky. And that region nowadays is the center from which we get pulses. But where does the light come from that we see there? This cloud of gas thrown out, why should gas continue to radiate energy? Because the energy has to disappear. Well, it seemed to me that it was reasonable to think of the source of the energy as contained in rotation of a star left behind in the explosion. I should have followed that up by looking for pulses of light coming from that object. But that was subsequently observed, I think if I remember right, 30 pulses a second. Uh, the indication that this there is really a rotating object at the center that powers the surrounding mass of gas.